Donald Trump's trial postponed and we were waiting for Donald Trump to testify. In fact, he was there in court and it sounds like he was ready to go as well. This came over from Lisa Rubin who was there. She's got a report saying Trump had all of his lawyers in tow. Everybody coming in. They were defense attorneys seated there. Everybody was just like on pins and needles waiting for him to take the stand to see how all of this would impact every other case that's going on. You know, he's got a lot of things happening. So she's going to give us an update. She was seated in the courtroom. Inner City Press is going to report on what actually happened. And we had some sick jurors. We had sick Alina. She had a fever. <sighs> Alina, get well soon. We need you back. Trump responded to this. We're going to talk about the media really begging for a conviction. And the question is, do the people even care? Not really. So here is what happened in court, courtesy of Inner City Press. And today was the big day where he was going to come in and testify. He was there. We were like, oh, perfect. It's going to be a great show. We're going to have a lot to unpack. Inner City Press was there reporting. Our friend Joe, good logic, was there. Everybody was there. Shout out to Joe. He's right next door on YouTube and Rumble and Locals. Inner City Press was reporting there. Judge Kaplan says, all right, everybody, good morning. Not such a good morning, I guess. Courtroom's filled, everybody's around. Says, fortunately, juror number three reported that he was ill. So rather than risk him coming together and having contact with you, ladies and gentlemen, we sent him home. Now he's gonna have a COVID test today and he's gonna report, but ladies and gentlemen, we're not gonna be taking testimony today. Now one or two of the lawyers are negative after the test. So the lawyers also had this going on. The judge said, and Andy's gonna tell how you can report if you have symptoms, jurors, and a number you can call to find out if we're going to proceed tomorrow or not. Now, from the day of this recording, from the day the jurors are there, he says, now, this is Kaplan. You know, this court continued right through COVID, so I'm sure we'll get through this. Thank you. Your transportation is coming. So all the jurors, you know, haul themselves in, get seated. They're like, oh, perfect. Trump's here today. And then nothing. Ugh, what down? So the jury leaves and Judge Kaplan says, okay, anything else? Oh yeah, one more thing. And remember last week we talked about Alina Abba. She filed a motion for a mistrial. Well, first of all, she made a motion for a mistrial in the middle of the trial. Judge said, denied, sit down, shut up. And then she filed another one in writing and we read through that last week. So she said, you know, Judge Kaplan says the defense made a motion for a mistrial again. That motion is going to be denied in all respects. Alina's there and apparently she's a little feverish as well. And she's there. She says, your honor, the New Hampshire primary is tomorrow. So if you have this scheduled for tomorrow, my client would have to testify tomorrow and he's got the primary tomorrow. So he needs to be there to, you know, win and close this thing out. And so Miss Carroll's lawyer, Miss Bergdorf, her attorney says, Your Honor, we want to finish this case tomorrow, Tuesday, the New Hampshire primary. Day. Kaplan says, Well, circumstances may result you getting what you want, or maybe not. We don't know. So that dude's going to go test, see if he's got COVID. If he is, maybe we have a delay. If it's not COVID, then maybe we're here tomorrow. Trump's second lawyer, Madeo, says, We'd also like to file a Daubert motion about Professor Humphrey's testimony. And a Daubert motion is a motion to verify whether somebody's really an expert or not. And you challenge them, you say, oh, Well, they say they're an expert, but like on what? And Kaplan says, Well, the time to do that was before she testified. He said, well, I'm not saying I'll view it as timely, but you could file a written motion and maybe I'll take a look at it. And that's the day. So they adjourn and there's nothing else going on. So they're done. Pretty quick day. Now there was more because apparently Lisa Rubin was there and Trump was there just ready to rock and roll. Here's what she said when she was seated there. She says, you know, when I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And she's a journo over for MSNBC, right? And we have seen a lot of her, but she's usually in court reporting from the side, right? From the street. She said, hey, I'm Lisa Rubin here outside Southern District of New York, whatever. She said, well, when I'm wrong, I say I'm wrong. And it looks like I might have been wrong today. Why? Because Trump was definitely ready and eager to testify. Okay, so I don't know what her prior position was, but presumably it's that Trump was not going to testify. And she's like, he's there and he's ready to go. Whew. What makes me say that? Well, as the press assembled in our assigned rows of the courtroom this morning, one of the court marshals ejected a slim, curly haired woman from a bench on the other side of the courtroom. Many of us gasped because that woman was Trump's criminal defense lawyer, Susan Nicholas. Now, while Nicholas did leave her seat, so they removed her, one of the court marshals removed her. Hey, come over here. You got to go. Don't know why. Maybe she was just needed for a meeting. Hey, they're looking for you. You know, maybe it wasn't actually ejected. Like, you know, they need you in this hall or whatever. Now, while Nicholas did leave her seat, she came back once the trial convened. And this time she had company. Okay. She came back into the courtroom with former SDNY prosecutor called Todd Blanche, Trump's lawyer, who represents Trump in three or four of his criminal cases, including the Manhattan DA case in which Nicholas is also counsel. I think he's on all of them except must be Georgia. So yes, Nicholas and Blanche, right? Trump's two criminal defense lawyers were there. Yeah, they could have been there for reasons other than Trump's expected testimony. They showed up for opening arguments last May during the Carroll trial, for example, and they were also accompanied by a, a jury consultant, this guy called Josh Dubin. But no one was anticipating the case to close today. Putting Trump aside, there are still two expected witnesses. So my guess is that Nicholas and Blanche were in fact there to see Trump testify. Woo! 
let's go, Trump. And that's the best sign to date that he was not bluffing, as I and so many others predicted. So watch this space. So we're excited about that. Definitely want to see Trump take the stand again. And that would be a lot of fun. See what he says. And we know he did that with Angeron. And Angeron was very difficult with him. And so we'll see if he testifies again and what Kaplan does in response. So this is Donald Trump's response. So even though the trial was postponed, Trump responded. He says, you know, this is ridiculous. I traveled late last night from the great state of New Hampshire to New York to attend one of the many crooked Joe Biden inspired witch hunt trials. And despite the fact that I was there on time and on schedule, baby, Mexico paid for the trip. It was just learned that one of the jurors is unfortunately not feeling well. And for that reason, today's session of the trial having to do with a woman I know absolutely nothing about has therefore been canceled with a new date to be determined. Of course, all of these various quote Biden political opponent trials just happen to be starting with great purpose in the middle of what it will be the most important election in the history of our country. They could have all began years ago or years after, but certainly not during the election. In actuality, they should have never been brought at all because as I have done nothing wrong. It is what it is and I will do what I have to do. All I ask for is fair judges and juries and I will win every one of these trials one at a time. He says in page two, these are political scams designed for high level election interference. Now the good news is the people of our country understand that better than anyone, including crooked Joe Biden, make America great again. He said, you know, Eugene was forced to change her story about her quote dress when Donna Karen, the designer of the dress, says that it wasn't conceived or manufactured until long after the date in question. So in other words, the Monica Lewinsky type gambit failed badly. Then also learning that there was zero evidence on the dress, despite all the threats, all of this hoax run is funded by political operatives. And so more about this dress that they say, you know, they say they've got all this evidence. There isn't any of it. So there's Trump calling that one out. And here's what he says. Finally, similar post. He says, E. Jean Carroll was forced to change her story on the Monica Lewinsky dress. She originally claimed that the event happened in 1994 and that she wore the Donna Karen dress on that day. Well, the problem is New York Times fact checkers found the dress wasn't even made by Donna Karen until long after 1994. Oops. The truth is she doesn't know what the day, month, season, year, or decade is because it did not happen. End this witch hunt now. And that sounds absolutely accurate. I'm sure Donald Trump and his team will not have any ability to make that argument to the jury because it's Judge Kaplan and that's detrimental to their case. That would make her look like a liar. So he doesn't want that to happen. Now, this is what is happening in response. So obviously the media is really salivating for more Trump convictions, more Trump liability. You hear people like George Conway, Mitt Romney, all these guys say Trump are a woman because a jury found him. And no, that's not what the jury said. The jury said no to R, which was the grab him by the purse, not the old hibbity dibbity. And so, you know, they're having to twist themselves. Well, a judge came back and ruled later that did finger penetration is the same thing as being R, and even though with a separate charge as the R versus the digital penetration, uh, you know, so it's cope. In other words, they're just coping themselves into saying, well, Trump is an R, -er, even though no jury found that. A judge did, and it's Judge Kaplan, what the jury actually said, because they said no when you asked them, did Trump R Carol? No. They wrote no, which means they don't find her credible on that because that was her main claim. So they think she's a liar and she couldn't even prove that standard beyond 51%, which is the preponderance of the evidence standard, not even beyond a reasonable doubt, like in a criminal court. So they are trying to bootstrap this R claim because it's all they've got. And they're trying to convict him because they think that's going to matter. Polls say differently, but here is a story over from Politico and you can almost, the feeling of panic is almost palpable. Here's what they say. Now I've got polls that show the opposite of this, but here they say polls show Trump could be doomed if he's convicted. Now look at the headline. Will a trial happen in time? In time for what? This is an opinion piece analysis from Politico from Ann Kush Kardari. Will a trial happen in time for what? Justice? To come to a reasonable outcome? To impanel a jury to make sure that Trump has enough time to read the discovery? For the Supreme Court to give Trump the due process of the law? Or like, do you just want to get this dude convicted? Will a trial happen in time? Oh, they gotta go fast. Hurry, hurry. Because they're friggin' petrified. Here is what Ann Kush writes. You know, the results in Iowa last week were a win for Trump, but they also underscored his ongoing legal troubles. Nearly a third of the caucus goers said that Trump would not be fit for the presidency if he's convicted. A third of them. A sizable defection, which if it held, would doom Trump's election chances. Now, polling in this area is challenging, so we're going to read some other polls. Some portion of these people say that Trump would literally be incapable of serving if convicted of a crime, but that's not true at all. But what is clear is that some lingering courtroom questions are now essential. When will Trump's myriad trials take place? 
And can any jury deliver a verdict before this November? Looking less and less likely. The answers are crucial to understanding how this could unfold. Now, over the coming year, we've got a bunch of different dates. Now, the most important of this that they're really trying to get back on track is the January 6th case. A recent survey suggested that a criminal conviction, particularly for election subversion, could ultimately sink his re-election bid. That's why they're racing on this one. So right now, this case is currently at the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. And when that comes back down, I believe that they're going to support Chutkin. Trump's going to apply for an en banc hearing to go back up to the Court of Appeals to see if he can get the full panel to hear the case. They'll probably reject that. Then he's going to the Supreme Court. So there's a long road ahead. Now, from a legal perspective, the three other pending criminal cases do not pose a potent threat at the moment. Georgia, because Fannie is making Willis with Wade. Florida, because classified documents complicate things. And Manhattan, because that's kind of an irrelevant case. That's the one with Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen, a convicted perjurer, as a key witness in Alvin Bragg's New York case. It's like nobody even cares. That's before 2020. So that's partly because state prosecutors are deferring to Jack Smith. Alvin Bragg said he's going to defer to Jack Smith. In Florida, the presiding judge, Eileen Cannon, seems like she's ready to push the trial out. And in Fulton County, this was already going to be delayed until like August, which of course is right in the middle of the election. You don't really want a trial that close to the November election. But that was of course all before we learned that Fannie was getting willis Now that leaves us with the federal criminal trial in Washington. And right now, the trial technically remains on the calendar for March 5th because the judge has said, we're going to keep this thing on the track. And if the court of appeals comes back down, boom, we're going to go right ahead as usual. Trump's claiming immunity. A panel of circuit court judges from the DC Circuit of Appeals, they heard oral arguments and were waiting for a ruling. But then of course, this could go up to the Supreme Court and ultimately lead to delays. Maine Secretary of State, you see her, Shanna Bellows, very thrilled with throwing Trump off the ballot. Trump's lawyers asked to hold Smith in contempt, but this is what he says about the campaign and the trial date. Now, the setting of trial dates in federal court is governed by a statute called the Speedy Trial Act. This is the highly unusual case in which the public has a strong interest in a speedy trial. Wait a minute. The public itself has expressed a strong interest in a speedy trial? That's weird. Is there like a person? Is there like an X account for the public? Hmm. Do you mean Democrats or do you mean like the public or do you mean like Liz Cheney and the DNC? When Politico magazine polled on this issue, 61% of respondents last summer, nice poll, they want this before November. There are four full months now between the end of June when the Supreme Court finishes its term. And on paper, that is more than enough time for the trial to take place. Okay, so they want this trial to be crammed back in and they're going to try to do it, my friends. Smith's team has said they anticipate their case taking four to six weeks. A trial in Washington during the summer or fall would also require confronting some other issues like the Republican Party convention. They don't care about that. Chutkin doesn't care about this at all. She doesn't care about conflicts. She scheduled a trial the day before Super Tuesday, by the way. So they say, what about the Justice Department rules? Now they have an unwritten 60 day rule where they try to avoid making trials. That was their excuse when they were investigating Hunter, but it may not save Trump. Why? It's unwritten. Of course, they don't care. I think that they would try to push this trial in even October. Like, why would they not try this trial in October based on everything else they've done thus far? So things are looking pretty good for Trump, but there's a long way to go and they want this trial to happen. So that is the update from Politico. And this type of sentiment is all over the place. Here is Joe Brzezinski. He was talking about this when he was on with his wife talking about Donald Trump on the morning Mika show. Here's what he says. The law is coming for Trump. But you have people like Marco Rubio and Elise Stefanik. Endorsed Trump, shout out. Basically saying the hell with the jury system. We don't trust juries anymore because they, anything. Well, why would they? Why don't you move your trials from Southern District of New York or from Washington, D.C. to their home states? Why don't you try Trump in Florida or try the J6ers in their home states? Why is everything happening in D.C.? Well, because it's about 95% left. That's why, Joe, you know it. Anything that goes against Donald Trump, if juries go against Donald Trump, then the hell with the jury system, the hell with the rule of law, and nothing applies to Donald Trump. And that's where- That's not what anybody's saying, but Joe, we're asking for actual due process of law. That's all. The presumption of innocence, equal protection, those types of things. Beyond a reasonable doubt standard, which we still don't see with the E. Jean Carroll case at all. Here we are once again. Well, you've got 200 people who have already pled guilty to felony- Oh my gosh. What's that guy's name? I didn't even recognize him. That's Matthews. Charges for January 6th at the U.S. Did you Capitol. recognize him? That's real business. These people can face up 18 to 20 years in prison. I think that the law is coming after Donald Trump and it's going to get him. And I think the same system that's worked for those 700 people all together, either felony or misdemeanor charges that have pled guilty to because of January 6th. And the mastermind behind it all is the guy who lied about saying he won the election of 2020, Donald Trump. He lied after the election. He lied on, on the day of January 6th, all through it. And 
coming out today. He's lied about the E. Jean Carroll case. I know E. Jean Carroll. She used to be on my show all the time. I've got to say, I believe. <laughs> yeah, did you guys have tingles up your legs together with your mice in your kitchens? Leave her completely just like the jury did. And I think they're going to give a lot of money to her because maybe $10 million in addition to everything because they really believe she's been hurt by this. I think Trump is just lying all the time. And the people that believe a liar all the time are crazy. And I can't even understand. Yeah. I do not understand why 70 yeah. some million people out there accept a lying, constantly lying person. He did not win the election. If you just asked him, yeah, point blankly, tell us the states that he won that we didn't know about. All the ones that had their water main shut off. So Fulton County was a pretty good one right there. Why did their water main break in the middle of the night? 11,000 votes was the margin. There's one, Georgia, right there. Water main broke. It's not a corrupt county in Fulton County. We have Fannie Willis funneling a million dollars to her lover. Both of these people hate Donald Trump, making millions, over a million dollars, maybe more, going after Trump as a political opponent. You don't think that they would rig 11,000 votes somewhere? You don't think that somebody would just make a box of votes go missing somewhere or something like that? And that was just one location there, Chris. Did he really win in Georgia right. where he asked the yeah. Secretary of State for 12,000 votes? Yes. Did he really win right. there? Where did he win? They don't know. They just follow his lead, his line. Well, we do know because we covered all of the litigation here where there was after lawsuit changing the rules so that ballots could be collected, signatures could be waived, drop boxes could be allowed, you could vote after the election was over. They were voting for like nine days in some states after the election. It was ridiculous. So yeah, Chris, it was rigged. And the only thing they can say is just, you know, no court is found or whatever. Give me a break. All right. So that is now what they're talking about. And they're also talking about this on MSNBC as well. This is MSNBC's hit show called now? Inside Gen Saki. And she brought on Andrew Weissman and Lisa Rubin. Here is the exchange between Jen Psaki and Andrew Weissman. Andrew, Trump laid bare his argument for immunity in pretty shocking terms last night. I just played the clip for everyone. He basically compared himself to a rogue cop. That's how I heard it. You said comments like those make it more important that the court issue a strong ruling against him. So talk us through that and what that might look like. Sure. Well, I think that what Donald Trump is doing, since he's really not going to win in the courts here, is I think he's making the election we'll see. a referendum on his legal woes, whether it's the Eugene Carroll case, which, you know, Lisa's been covering, or the criminal trials. And Trump is making it a referendum. Trump is out there talking about the issues. You guys are the ones who are prosecuting him and talking. You got a whole podcast about his prosecution. And he's doing everything he can to avoid a judgment from a jury in those cases, but instead is going directly to the voters to essentially say, you know, help me out here. If you actually vote for me, all of this will go away. I think that the chances that the DC circuit is going to say that- That's a normal thing, by the way. When you have a corrupted government and you say this government is not doing the will of the people, when they are failing at every turn, when they are weaponizing the government against a huge portion of the population, and they are, it's all right to vote for new government, to say this is not the priority that we want. So that's perfect. Yes, Trump can come in, win, and disband all of these people. You're gone. And I would absolutely support that wholeheartedly. That's why we're voting for him. I wish he'd go even further with the FBI and so on, but we'll take what we get. That he is immune and the Supreme Court even taking the case, even if they do take mm. the case, which is not at all clear. I also do not think that he is going to find five votes. He, in fact, there may not be any votes for his proposition. Now he's talking about immunity and he might be right on that, right? The Supreme Court is a little bit squirrely out there. You may have seen the other vote that came down today, very, very short order, which is why we didn't do a full segment on it. But the Supreme Court has said that the feds can cut the border wire at the Texas border. Now that's going to cause a you know, bunch of other issues, I think. I'm not sure if Texas is going to allow them into Eagle Pass so that they can physically cut the barbed wire, the razor wire, but that's going to be a whole nother thing that comes to a head. But my point is it was five to four. Amy Coney Barrett, Judge Roberts joined in with the three lefties. So we don't have a lot of faith. You know, the Supreme Court is not reliable. Even though it's a six, three court, John Roberts is squishy as can be. And Amy Coney Barrett, you know, these people are federalists and they are institutionalists. And so if they can concoct a way for the establishment to remain in power, I've got concerns that they'll do that. So this is Lisa Rubin. Now she was the same one that we listened to earlier. She was outside actually in the trial earlier. This was her yesterday before the trial took place today. For no other reason than the sheer logistics of how disruptive his presence in any courthouse or courtroom has been. However, my expectation is that like he has before, he is bluffing that he will not come to testify tomorrow. That's in part because there's a very limited range of issues about which he could permissibly testify. This mm. trial is just about damages. It's not about whether he sexually assaulted her. 
It's not about whether he defamed her or even continues to defame her with each passing day of the campaign. So ultimately, I predict he won't come. And indeed, our folks in New Hampshire have not seen mm. any indicia that he's preparing to testify by taking the time, for example, for witness prep. Okay, so she was obviously wrong on that. And so she was, to her credit, I mean, very, very clear about that. She said, oh, I was wrong. He was there and looks like he was ready to go. So we're going to see what the trial schedule looks like and when he is back. But here are the opposite polls. Okay, this is something saying that, no, people really don't care about all these political prosecutions being adverse to Trump. They see them for what they are. And they say this is not appropriate. This came over from Interactive Polls. Says if Trump is convicted of crimes related to his handling of classified presidential documents, who would you vote for for president? Hmm. Trump is a convicted classified document person. Bruh. 53% to 47 for Trump. And remember, Joe Biden had his own classified documents in the garage of his house that Hunter may have accessed and sent emails about. And he was not the president. He was the senator. So he didn't have the opinion clause power like Donald Trump has. Here's another question. If Trump is convicted by a jury for Rico, which is Big Fanny, in trying to influence 2020, who would you vote for for president? Trump plus two, 51 to 49. Ha boom! If Trump was convicted for inciting J6, who would you vote for for president? Trump at plus four. Four. Amazing. You can see the, how the splits break down. So Trump, Dems are voting 84% for Joe, 91% for Trump, obviously party line split, but even 16% of Dems are voting for Trump. Wow, that's a pretty big number there. So that looks good. 51 to 49 here, same splits across the board, one after the other. And so I think people are starting to recognize what this is all about. There's been a lot of people covering these scam trials. Every time Fannie gets Willis or something else happens like that, everybody says, oh yeah, all these people told us that they were out they're fighting for justice. No, they're not. They're fighting for their political cause. It's not justice at all. And people are able to see that it is becoming more and more clear. And we're going to be here as we continue to cover this. So Trump is going to be back, whether he's back tomorrow or Wednesday, time will tell. And we'll be here continuing to cover it, my friends. So thank you for joining us as we do. This one went for Joe Biden, actually. Yeah, you're right. This one went to Biden. So I was off on that. Let me correct that. Biden was up by four. So I was wrong on that one. You're right. Last one went to Biden. So I misread that. Biden wins by four. Interesting. Okay. So they don't care about Rico. They don't care about classified documents, but maybe J6 is the big one. Okay. That's fine. We still have some work to do on J6. We're going to talk about J6 next and show you what a scam that is as well. So the polls are trending in the right direction. It looks like Trump is going to testify and we'll be here to cover it as he does. My friends, thank you for subscribing wherever it is you're watching this. Thanks for checking out robertgovea.com. The link is down in the description below. And thanks for inviting someone to come over here and join us as we go through each one of these legal sagas one after another. We'll be looking forward to seeing you back here on the next one.